You are now tuned in to The Gifted Gab. We're back. Another episode of The Gifted Gab. It's your boy Alex Eskandarka, and I've got a special, special guest today. Hmm. That's that me? That's you, man. <laughs> oh, sweet. It's your man, Jesse Lipscomb. I didn't use your... I'm too grown to say your, your boy. Your boy? I'm grown. I'm grown. Grown-ass wow. man. Why? I think you got a little bit of child left in you. I mean, there's a lot of child left in me, but I'm probably going to get snipped so they don't come to fruition. <laughs> <laughs> man, not to make it awkward or anything, but, you know, welcome, man. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, you, you put on a great, great event. Yeah, you did too, man. I appreciate you, uh, you know, offering your services. That was smooth. Well done. Man, I just appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I see, you know, when uh, we, we first spoke, I saw I saw a, an example of a guy who I'm like, okay, I like what I see from this guy's lifestyle. You know, he's himself. All right. He, he does what he wants to do. Maybe he takes on a lot, but it's like you, you're always into something. You got couple of shows coming up and, sure and, you know so essentially it's like this is the kind of lifestyle i could see myself living so i'm like let me let me itch myself over here a little bit more you know what yeah I mean? yeah how did you get into it how did you say like these are this is what i want to do yeah i mean it's it's one of those mix of of being stubborn for sure um a little bit of fearlessness uh, mixed in with, it's like a recipe, I suppose, uh, support from, a, from my family, um, living where we live. So, you know, there's somewhat of a parachute. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to university and have, uh, some degrees. So like, not that I ever had thought about a fallback, but I'm sure it's in your subconscious that it's there. But for me, I, I, I got the taste early, at least in the acting world. I was 14 uh, and I first did my first show and it was with Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier was my mentor for many years afterwards. Uh, so the acting bug hit really early. Um, speaking, same thing, really early. And I, I, I found where I felt like home really fast. Um, interesting part of that is it's a home that's always moving. So I know what it felt like, but then you're always chasing it. And I also enjoy the chase. Um, it's very much like sales, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you, the month starts over, you could have a crazy month, but then you're back to zero. And that's how it is every time you finish a show. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, there's just energy in um, a life that constantly flips and changes and requires you to stay on your toes and, and hustle no matter what. So that kind of life uh, gives me energy. So I love it. Would you say that's what keeps you young? Oh, you say I look young? <laughs> okay, I see you, Alex. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess so. Yeah, maybe it does. Like, if it keeps your mind active, you know, that's what they say. You got to keep, you got to use it or you lose it. So I'm constantly um, challenging myself, uh, striving to do better, hard on myself often. We're often our worst critics, for sure. But like, I, I know that I can do absolutely anything. And so then if I decide to do something, not doing it is a failure to myself, and that feeling sucks. Oh, yeah. So, oh, I, I don't like that feeling. I try to run from it for sure. And actually, it's funny. I maybe I was like twenty. So I don't know if you were born. It was twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, e either way, I uh, <laughs> I remember I wrote this thing down about like who I thought I was, and one of the things that I had written was that I. Because I, at a young age, I would win a lot of things. Even just playing in, at recess, grade one and grade two, we'd go out and we'd play like flag football or race. And I'd crush everybody to the point where my friends didn't even want to play with me anymore. So like I didn't have, my friends like, ah, oh, Jesse's coming, we're not playing anymore. And so grade three, I made like a conscious decision to not try as hard so I could have friends. Damn. I know. This is like a big moment. I remember this moment. I'm like, I, w I want someone to hang out with me at recess. So I'm like, I'm just not going to like try as hard. And it worked. I had a whole bunch of friends. It was great. Everyone wanted to play at recess. Um, and then fast forward like a, f a few years later, and it was weird. I'm like, I'm holding back to have a circle of friends. So essentially, my circle of friends are holding me back. It's basically what happened. It's a cage. It is. And so I decided to forget that. I'm just going to work my ass off and see who hangs around. And so I did that, as I did that, you know, this idea of making sure I do my best all the time, uh, I, I continued to win at a lot of different things. But I was winning because I was scared to lose. That's what I was. I was winning because I've seen people with less than me do better, go further, do more. And so if I couldn't do the things with what I have, with the privileges I have, living in St. Albert, you know, being healthy, straight, male, decent looking, 
I mean, like <laughs> in like junior high, I was smoking, but now I'm getting a little old and decrepit. But like all of that stuff, if I can, if I can't win with that, and people are winning with less, I I, I hated that thought. So I was winning out of fear. Fast forward like ten years later, I switched it to instead of running from fear, I was running towards love. And so when I started running towards love, it had nothing to do with fear. And I was just chasing things I love, I'm so passionate about, and I want to be around, whether that's people, whether that's activities, contracts, jobs, acting gigs, writing music. And this idea of running towards love has made it so much more freeing than this idea, I'm not not worried about failing. Like, I don't fail. You can't fail. You either quit or die, Mm. right? Like, so I just choose to do something else, but I didn't fail. And it's made the journey a lot more enjoyable. It's made it very black and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit more binary, you know? Yeah, yeah for sure. It's a very, like, you operate in a very unstructured environment, you know, to be able, like you were saying, show's over, start from zero again, right? How how has, you know, going from the basketball world, right? Mm-hmm. Cause, you know, you played the sports, which is very structured, and then coming into somewhere that's really unstructured, how, where, how do those connect? What did you take from basketball that works here? Yeah, I would say that it's interesting because I've heard that a lot from the outside. It looks unstructured. I think it's quite the opposite. Mm. Like you can't have freedom without structure. You can't have freedom without like a regimented program. Um, the freedom comes in, even if I were to pare it down to uh, my day. I, if I wake up at 645 and I know what my day is because it's in my calendar, then when I have a chunk of free time, I'm actually free. Mm. That's the feeling of freedom because I'm not missing anything. I know that all of my stuff is done, so I have a feeling of freedom. All it means for me is that I have a lot of different things in my day, but they still they all require a certain amount of pre-work. They require a certain amount of putting things aside, knowing I have to get this stuff done. And because of that, I feel like I have a very, very free life, but it's very structured. And that structure comes for sure from sports. You know, I mean, track and field was the sport at the early age. Yes, I played some ball competitive level as well. But, you know, as an athlete, you have to prep. You have to be prepared for the biggest moments. You can't show up at a big moment and hope you'll be great. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my life is prep time, right? Uh, And the more big moments that show up and the more I've been prepared for them, then that's that's the best part. That's competition. Maybe you win, maybe you lose, but you're going to do the best that you could do on that day uh, because you're you're prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're not prepared. You leave it. You're like... I could have, I should have, why didn't I? That's the worst worst feeling. It's the The worst worst feeling in the world. Mm. So I don't feel that anymore because I prep. Mm. Obviously, we're still in the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a long, the longest pandemic I've ever been. (laughs) (laughs) I've only seen SARS and Ebola. um, Tell me about how to strive in in the uncertainty because a lot of people are having a hard time. Yeah, they are. They are. I think, you know, for sure some people are built different, wired different, and this unstructured life for them is new, right? The idea of that maybe tomorrow I'm not at my office, maybe I have a job, maybe I don't, maybe my kids are going to be in school, maybe they're not. All of these maybes in a life where everything was relatively predictable beforehand, you wake up, you go to the office, you pick up the kids, you know you've done your work, you get a check, and you're probably not going to get fired. Like that, for someone like that, I can assume that this would be difficult. You're actually asking to switch up everything you do and have faith in it. What you're actually, what you're asking you to do is have faith in yourself. Mm-hmm. When often you've had faith in a, a system, a job, a support thing. External. External pieces. It reminds me of this quote that I heard about, uh, so a bird sitting on a branch is never worried if the branch is gonna break because it always trusts in its wings, right? Mm. And so for me, that's the thing. Like I have always trusted in my wings, no matter on the on the highs and the lows and lows have been lo- for a long time but i'm like it's tomorrow it'll be the next day it's the next thing we'll hit so the prep time doesn't change it's always that so for me the pandemic has been awesome because it gave me even more time and more space and leveled the playing field across the planet oh yeah across the planet so whatever industry you're in no one has solved the problems that this pandemic would bring so you you are no longer like man i wish i was alive during the dot-com boom, or I wish I was in the gold. We're in it. We're in it right now. So whatever issues that you're facing, actually the problems don't, I mean, the solutions don't exist and it's there if you want it. Right. But again, I say not everyone's wired that way, but for me, I I'm looking around at anything in any of my industries that wasn't working or struggling during the pandemic. How can I fix it? How can I show an example of it working? Uh, and that keeps me busy and not going 
out of my mind because I'm an extrovert and need to hang out and party and speak to people, <laughs> right? So instead, I'm just like solving problems left, right, and center and creating and spending that time doing the stuff I would love to do. So would you say you're an introvert or extrovert? I think I am mostly extrovert, but I need... It's yeah, interesting. I mean, I'm guessing I'm a little bit of a hybrid, but probably 70-30. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm more extroverted. Like, I recharge with around people, um, but I also don't want to be around a lot of people for a long time. I'm the person who will go to, like, a concert, and, like, three songs in, I'm like, okay, I'm good. Like, I, I got the feeling, got the people. I know what you sound like. I want to go home or go somewhere else. That also might be ADHD. <laughs> now that I'm saying it out loud, I'm like, no, that's that's actually what you're medicated for. <laughs> All right, so no, I'm an extrovert. I think, I, I think fully, and I think what I just said out loud is that's why I have medication when for dexedrin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to touch on something you did just tap into. Um, you said right now we're in that that boom. Mm -hmm. How has the playing field been leveled in your industry? Yeah, I mean, so for our industry, let's go back to March. I was in the middle of shooting a uh, Netflix series. All acting everywhere canceled. So anyone in the entertainment industry, what they were doing at that time for work did not exist. And there wasn't another job you could jump over to. So that means everybody isn't working and everybody wants to work. How do we provide work? That was my thought. How do I do what I want to do? So I wrote a TV show. So I, I spent the next three days. I wrote uh, the pilot to uh, an episodic uh, romantic comedy uh, show called Locked in Love. In three days? Yeah, but I mean, I I didn't have to go anywhere else. Yeah, right. right not, like, what, yeah. So yeah, three days. I sat down. I worked like it was a job, eight hours a day, and wrote it. And then the next day, I reached out to because I always try to keep my contacts and people I've really enjoyed working with. I stay in contact with them after the show, and mm -hmm. just who knows when we'll work you together. Never know. Usually in the entertainment industry, theater or film, you do a show. You could be like in love, best friends, everything, and you feel like you'll never stop talking. And literally, like the day after, you two years passed and you haven't said hello. I've always tried to make sure I reach out just once in a while, see how things are. So you know, I reached out to about twenty different actors across North America in eight different cities, and almost all of them got back and said, "Yeah, I want to do the show." They read it, they liked it. So now, how do we shoot a show this way? So I created this thing called remote content directing. So I made sure everyone had the same uh, camera, lighting, sound, and then I would direct them via Zoom so we didn't have like a cheesy Zoom movie. Sorry if you've made a cheesy Zoom movie. I just didn't want to make that. I'm sure <laughs> yours isn't cheesy and it might be amazing. But I didn't have that as my idea. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to direct a professional-looking uh, show. Um, and so we did. And then, you know, things like music. So this is that idea of prep. Um, I make music, I write music, I sing. So all of the soundtrack is, is my songs or stuff I wrote for it, whether I was writing country music or uh, whatever it was. So that, there, boom, we have our soundtrack. You know, our, our lighting, our color correction, our DP, everybody was down to play at that, st at that time because they didn't have anything else to do. Yes, we got to get people for next to nothing because no one was making anything and they wanted to do what they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. We finished the show and then in about a month and a half and then we did we actually did a premiere for it. So we found a drive-in theater. So we premiered it at a drive-in theater on the West End, which was so cool, sold out, watching the show that we made two months ago. Um, and now fast forward, the show has been picked up um, by Frantic Fil Films in L.A. Uh, we just had a meeting last night about uh, what we're doing and how I'm going to write the rest of the season. And eight episodes will be streaming on a major platform uh, sometime next year, which is amazing, right? So but just awesome. this is just like, man, yeah, I got some time. Everyone's got time. It's this idea of like, what, where are we right now? I can mope or, or I can use the pandemic as it is, a mirror. It is a mirror. It shows you who you actually are. So many people have said, I want to write a book. I want to be a singer. I want to learn guitar. I want to learn piano. How come you're not? Well, I have a job. I'm busy. I have this. You've had 11, nine months, 10 to 11 months of time. To do something. And if you haven't done it yet, look in the mirror and say, you're a liar. You didn't want to do it. You wanted to talk about doing it. Mm. You didn't want to do it because mm. you'd have done it. So stop, not stop talking about it. Just understand you like talking about doing stuff you won't do. That's, put that on your business card. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> what would you call that? What would you? What would you? What was that? Well, I mean, you'd call it a like a vast majority of humans. <laughs> I don't know what the name <laughs> for it is, but the vast majority of humans say they want to do a thing, mm -hmm. uh, and I believe them, and they'd pass a polygraph probably. Uh, but the problem is, like the doing thing, it's this motion. Once you're in motion, it's so easy. You just got once you get this giant heavy boulder rolling down the hill, you can't stop it. Yeah. But it's it's heavy, right? It's so you got heavy. like to move it, and it's a new boulder. You don't even know where the handholds are. That's how, I get it. It's work. But if you want to do it, just do the stuff. You Make just, the worst shit you've ever made so it's out of the way. Yeah. Like it's Absolutely. probably going to be bad. Yeah. So what? 
Would you? I I always classify people as you know planners, like mm-hmm. really really plan 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 plan, and sometimes might never do it. Mm-hmm. And then there's people that just say, you know, fuck it, I'm just gonna go and figure it out as yeah. I go. Yeah. Which one would you consider yourself as? I mean, I'm always fearful to classify po- folks putting them in boxes because then it's like you can't get out of said box. Um, but I think I am, if I had to pick in your description, I'm a go and just do the thing and learn on the fly, but not do the thing irresponsibly. I won't start until I, I'm confident that I can do it. Because mm-hmm. there's no thing you or anybody else that has ever not done that they believed that they could do with every single fiber in their being. Every single fiber. They believed they were going to do it. You've done it. Mm-hmm. Only times you didn't were when you had some doubts. And you weren't ready. You didn't, you were, you were, so you didn't do the, the self work. It's not external, right? Like if you believe you're going to do the thing, all of a sudden all of your energy goes there and you don't stop till it's done, then it gets done. Like it actually always gets done. So, you know, for me, I'm like, I'm going to do the thing when I have that feeling. I, I, I don't d- jump into things where I'm like, I don't know if I really like, ah, so I'll say no to a lot of stuff because I don't feel that, you know? Yeah. But if I feel it, I'm in there. I actually did a psychology neurobiology was my, what I studied in school. And one of the things uh, is called a Hermanum's brain dominance test. And it puts your brain into four qu- quadrants, left and right, then the other quadrants. So things like analytical thinking and then being like super creative. And I looked and mine was like so far on the right side, which was mostly the creative things, not planning things. Um, basically, I didn't need to work at being great at that. Mm-hmm. So I didn't. I spent most of my time learning the other things. Like learn, so making spreadsheets about my day, um, just organizing chunks, because that's the hardest stuff for me. So I put work there. I'm not going to lose the other things. It just made me more Mm -hmm. well-rounded, and I'm able to attack some of these things. Normally, I just jump into. Now I jump into, but I also know that this needs to happen. This needs to fit into my schedule, or it'll fail. It's like, you know, refining the all-around game. You know, Mm -hmm. you're a good shooter. Okay, maybe I need a little bit of handle to get my shot off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the new ball player. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, not the old one. Like you were, a bit, you were a big man. Do not leave the key. Do not even practice shooting from over here. That's that's the old school. That's the old school. <laughs> but they still did fine, you know. And that's the thing. If you have, if you know your lane and that's your lane, then be the best ever in that lane. Mm-hmm. And don't whine that you're in another in another lane. Just be yeah, in your lane. Just be in your lane yeah. and work out the other things. I want all the lanes. It's a big truck, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want all the lanes. A yeah. big truck. Good yeah. old Alberta. Yeah. What was it like growing up here? You know, I'm not a I'm not an Edmonton guy, so I always try to gauge the temperature of what it was really like. Well, it's a weird thing to say because what do I compare it to? Because mm-hmm. this is where I grew up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't up against it, but I was. But I didn't know any different, so I couldn't do anything but focus on what my reality was. And my reality was, I will make it amazing. And I and so looking back, can I see all of the uh, systemic racist things that would have gotten in the way of me progressing further sure do i see the microaggressions that happen all the time absolutely did i see them in the moment no i was too focused on what i wanted to do mm-hmm. right so it's this thing i i could i never really want to be like ah oh, man it would have been better if no the only person who's ever not had me have a great day a great time is you is me no other person no one's made me feel bad i felt bad because i did something i felt bad no mm-hmm. one's done anything except for me and I like that feeling. Like, it's on me if I win, if I lose, uh, if I'm happy, if I'm sad. And that doesn't mean that I don't have support and love and people who are helping. But I can never put blame on them for mm-hmm. something that didn't go the way I wanted it to go. Sounds, so for me, St. Albert was good. Sounds like, uh, what's the word? Accountability. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> you know absolutely. I mean? it's, yeah. Just, it's accountability, right? I think I'm, I'm a big guy on accountability. And, you know, you control your reality at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's what you make of it, right? Yeah, no, I, I love... Uh, I love this place. Yeah. I, I really, Why? I don't know. I never could put my finger on it, but I just I found it's there's a really nice sense of community. Yeah. Um, it's a lot slower. My reference is obviously Toronto. So mm-hmm. Toronto is everything is go go go, and you're constantly on the move. You know, I come here and you know, I don't have to worry about switching lanes when I'm driving. Sure. I just take my time. You know. Yeah. You like that slowed atmosphere? Yeah, I'm a pretty laid back, nonchalant. So you couldn't be slow in Toronto. I tried. Yeah, it was difficult? Yeah. Everybody else around you is so... Yeah, yeah. It's it's almost contagious. It's their life. It is their life. Yeah. But it is... I I find it is a little bit contagious. Fair enough. You know? And you get separated from that, you know? Sometimes you never know that 
like you were saying, St. Albert was all you knew. Mm -hmm. Toronto was all I knew. Right. So everything I saw was like, everybody's on go. I'm just like, why is everybody always on go? Like, let's let's chill out a bit. Like, mine was the opposite. Everyone's on like slow. And I'm yeah. like, why are you, what are you, how are you playing games? You're gaming? Why don't you make the game? Invent the game. How are you just playing the game? I've always been on, on the go, go. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was lucky too, young. I traveled a lot still with sports and with acting. So uh, St. Albert's where I grew up. But it wasn't all I knew, mm -hmm. but it was all I know for growing up. Does that make sense? You know yeah. what I mean? Like I went through St. Albert Elementary, Junior High, High School, and then I left to Atlanta after that for a good eight, nine years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do you see, uh, you know, Edmonton going in terms of, you know, creatives, entrepreneurs? Like it, I find it a very collaborative space. Collaborative hey, space. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. It is very much uh, a place where it doesn't matter who you can basically get a meeting and have a sit down and talk with, mm -hmm. which I love. Um, and Edmonton's going wherever the, the bravest, most courageous entrepreneurs and creatives take it, uh, no matter what happens government wise, funding wise, right? Like the people who are like, I'm just going to make the show. I'm just going to do the podcast. I'm going to do the documentary, just doing it. How are you doing it? I'll figure it out. Right. That's the, we'll basically decide what this place looks like and what we can do with it. Ideally, I hope we have big, big dreamers. They don't just want to get a show done, but get the show done. Not like a good show for Edmonton or for Canada, but like, let's make the world's greatest stuff. That would be awesome. I would love to be able to stay here and uh, achieve whatever things I want to achieve. I, I'm pretty sure I won't be. I mean, I've already left and I'm, I'll live in other places. But Edmonton's a place I would like to be able to always have a home, um, you know, so I could keep all of branching people and just put Edmonton on different maps. We're on the map already, but I mean, just stepping up the game, if I could have any help in that, I would love to. I like that, that way you just brought up like the olive branch mm -hmm. you know that's something it's not really common in a lot of big 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 cities yeah not at all doggy dog it's everywhere and keep your cards to your chest nobody wants to help it's re it's weird to me yeah but that's it's just that's pretty much everywhere yeah it's, that's what i and I, I find that that's toronto that's toronto oh, the yeah. complete opposite mm -hmm. right where toronto is like you know everybody's it's all competition everybody's yeah. like you know i'm competing against you i'm if i have one up on you why am i going to yeah. Extended olive branch. Yeah, the cities are insecure. Like, Edmund is not an insecure city. That's why we can collab. If you're insecure, you don't want to tell people your secrets. You, you think they might do it better or steal it from you. Mm -hmm. But, like, take it as a person, like a super secure person is like, yeah, I'll help you. Absolutely. And now it's this is how I did it. I don't think you knowing that's going to make mine worse. It, uh, you can't do mine. You'll never be me. But I hope I will help you be better. And that's what they don't do. I don't want to tell you my my film idea that you're probably not going to make anyway. <laughs> like, like, like I'm just saying, like, like, uh, like, just if you start talking about the things, new ideas come together, uh, t new co collaborations come together. But I think Edmonton's a pretty secure city in that regard. Mm -hmm. We're not afraid to share our ideas without having like nine, uh, you know, what are the things we got to sign all the time? Non-disclosures, non -disclosure you know, like non-disclosures on like a coffee. And fair enough, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. Of course, take care of your intellectual property, blah, blah, blah. But they go a little far mm -hmm. uh, in many cities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'm a fan of NDAs. I mean, yeah. you I mean exactly. <laughs> protect your property. You protect it. Yeah. But I mean this on the sense of like, um, you don't have a property yet. We're literally having coffee. I got this crazy idea. Actually, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Like you, you, sh you shouldn't actually. It's, so just yeah, yeah just don't don't bother. Just, just, yeah. keep, it, just keep it to <laughs> keep yourself. It to yourself. <laughs> That's where you're gonna die with it. <laughs> um, what about sports? You know, you're, you did athletics. Yep. You know, where do you see sports going here in Canada? You know, everything's kind of come to a halt. Yeah, I mean, hockey will never halt. No, it's, yeah. we, it's like the fuel of Canada, right? Mm -hmm. But what do I? Sports is sports are so important, man. They're such a beautiful just display of hard work and passion and and like you could be the m best athlete on earth and still fall just a little short you see the humanity of people and we like to band together always with whatever city or i love that i think it's really cool like how you could just this is weird to say it's cool but how you could just hate someone from calgary <laughs> <laughs> like i again i'm not that dude i'm like if edmonton's out i cheer for calgary mm -hmm. and people are like what I want Calgary's players to all get COVID. Like, what's, what's wrong oh, with that's you? Crazy. That's so sick. <laughs> that's like, no, I hope they're the closest city. I'm a proximity fan. Always. Like, it's, I mm -hmm. want the best team. I go home team first, then the best team, uh, and then proximity team. Those mm -hmm. are the order of how I cheer for folks. Because I love the best. I don't like underdogs. They're annoying. They mess up everything. <laughs> you don't like underdogs? I hate them. They're what? in the way. They're so, what they do is like, so here's a champ who should be winning and breaking records and some lucky 
underdog comes in. Only time I like underdogs is if I bet on them because I make some money. But I don't yeah. like them. They mess up the dream. Shout out the Raptors. I bet on the underdogs. Yeah, but they did. They, I mean, yes, but. <laughs> yes, but they weren't underdogs when you bring in a, you know. Yeah, Kawhi yeah, Exactly. So what I'm saying, and people are going to hate it. They hate that I don't like underdogs. Uh, I, I don't. It's not that I don't like them. It's people. I'm sure they're great human beings or teams. Fine. But I'm just talking about they mess up the plan that we've been worked on since the person was like six years old <laughs> and they're about to break the all-time record and some be like whoa i tripped and fell and won like what did uh, and then you don't even <laughs> but an underdog that wins and then continues to win love That's, that person yeah love that person right but just this little blip like, what kind of mess in the matrix are you <laughs> gross go home i love that i love that one one cool thing about you is you know you went to hbcu before it was cool uh, yeah historically black college and university for all you non-melanated individuals <laughs> <laughs> what was what was that like you know what was that experience like i've always wondered you know i i got a couple of friends that yeah went to some yeah it is uh i said this a little bit ago um on something i was talking about but i didn't realize the weight of whiteness uh until i went there and it was removed so this idea where you know, I can walk into the mall, walk down the street, and I know I'm the only black guy. I see the eyeballs. You feel it. Um, code switching when I'm just talking with different individuals and how I have to speak. You know, just thoughts of where I put my hands, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. At Morehouse, all black. We didn't talk about black stuff. We just talked. It was just a guy and a guy. It's an all guy, male school. That's why it was a guy and a guy. Um, but we just, it was just, just dudes talking to dudes, doing human stuff. That was it. It wasn't always about being black. So the weight of whiteness off of your shoulders is so freeing. It's awesome. It's amazing. I get why white people wouldn't want to get rid of it. It is <laughs> no, It is so nice. And, and not only that, like fast forward maybe uh, five months after, I didn't even realize it anymore. So now I can also see why people are like, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm just... Uh, there's no, there's no privilege here. I like, but it didn't feel like it at Morehouse either. After a while, I, it was just the world. The world was accepting to me, and I could walk freely through it, and it was amazing. Then I came back here. I was like, oh, Jesus. You're black <laughs> as shit, Jesse. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, But that, that experience was awesome. It was amazing just to see representation in every level, from like pilots to doctors to, uh, to the teachers to, to staff, everywhere. Uh, and there, that idea of there's no monolith, like I knew that in the early late 1990s, like you still had your heavy metal fans, you still had your your straight, bi, queer, trans, you still had people who like hip hop and dance. Like it was just still, of course, it was a whole world of people. They just all had a lot more melanin in their skin, and it really showed how little that is of a thing. The thing that was very uh, apparent was that we can't just live like that in a white world. Mm -hmm. So I. Uh, yeah, they, more else is amazing. It's just a very cool school. I mean, Martin Luther King went to school there. Spike Lee, Samuel Jackson. It was a good chunk of folks. John Washington, Denzel's son. Yeah, he, he played the balls there too. A bunch of people. It's a good circle to be around of uh, of dreamers that like did we, uh, like mediocre was not a, an option. Hmm. It wasn't an option there. I didn't know John David Washington went there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, he was a freshman or a sophomore on my senior year. Damn. I, Denzel I and Wesley Snipes always came to the football games. They were always there together. Snipes would come in like his uh, like red or green full gaitered hat with a feather, <laughs> leather boots. And uh, Denzel's always straight. He's training day. That's like regular Denzel. It's training day, Denzel. <laughs> he's just there in a white tee, just a ball cap. And people would come up and he'd just be like, nah. But Wesley's like, what do you need? What do you want? Want me to sign this? Like, they're so like polar opposites, but best friends. It was That's fun. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know. John David was his son. So yeah, like probably during the pandemic. By design, too. He really fought against the family business. He didn't want to, didn't want to act because his dad was one of the best actors in the world. Uh, and I know he fought against it. Wanted to play football. He got drafted. He played NFL for one year. Um, and then I mean, it's in you, man. You can't help it. And obviously, there's some nepotism. Uh, but he's really good talent. And how could you not be? You're surrounded by that your whole life, right? Um, but he did want to carve his own path. I think he did a pretty good job. It's not like this is Denzel's son all the time. No, you know, John, not. John just does his thing he, and he's doing it well. He did it his, I feel like he did it his yeah. way. Yeah. Know? I think he that's did. really important. Yeah. And, 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 uh, Denzel gave him space to do it, which is really cool. I don't know if I could do it that way with my kids. I like, I would want to be like, just, I mean, I, maybe I'll get better cause I'm still only, you know, 12, 13 and 11 and another one. He's four. How many times? I mean three yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but you know that idea of being able to step back and uh well they're still trying to do the industry you crushed 
Like, you crushed it. Mm-hmm. I got this, Dad. Like, I'm like, <laughs> you ain't got shit. Come on. But he did a good job. Yeah. Yeah. So which, uh, are they all hooping? What, what, oh, my kids? Yeah. Well, no, they're not allowed. AHS. Well, but no, oldest plays ball, both balls. He has two balls, but I meant he plays <laughs> baseball and basketball. Um, and then my middle son is m- more, he's like a competitive snowboarder. He, uh, he wins all these snowboarding competitions. He's all bendy and flippy. And then my youngest, I think if I had to pick any who will be an ar- artist, he's uh, like a singing musical machine. Like not every day, daddy, can we karaoke? I'm like, yes, yes. That's awesome. I have like no friends who say that. <laughs> you're my best friend and you're four. <laughs> yeah. He's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Usually the youngest is. From when I was studying, they used to say the youngest is usually the most the creative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the youngest too. You're the yeah, youngest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many? How many siblings? Older brother, older sister. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's uh, not that this will air today, but the day this aired is my sister's birthday. Deanne McIntyre, happy birthday, sister. I love you. That's beautiful. Beautiful. I wish someone would call me and sing me happy birthday on my birthday. Hey, yeah. Alex. Happy oh, birthday like, oh. when it's here. <laughs> still got some time still yeah, got some time yeah. i'm a march baby so awesome yeah. are you late march yeah you're in aries yeah yeah me too that's, that's, i don't know we can't like oh, look no, at, we no. didn't do that it's okay yeah uh no we actually had a uh, one of our early episodes we had uh, an astrologer on here yeah and i wasn't really big on astrology and all that stuff no, you didn't believe in stars no i didn't they're there uh, they're big balls of fire <laughs> Uh, yeah, and then, you know, she kind of came on, educated us, yeah. and I was like, you know, before I knew it, I was checking my horoscope, looking yeah. at my birth chart, Sure. You know? now I'm like, you Finding know, out your, wa- your, fi- your water signs, and your, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that, you know, it makes perfect sense, you know, and, uh, and I think that's wh- where I'm at right now, and you'll probably be able to relate to this, is you're just always soaking in new and new information because mm-hmm. you never know where it might take you you never know who's on the the person who's on the other end of it you know so i find that you i look at you and i see this guy he's good at networking he's good at keeping relationships mm-hmm. like you were saying you never let a, a relationship die with the people you i mean unless we were like you know relationship but that's, relationship that's, those that's ones are different. different that's totally different some of them have to die yeah. sometimes you gotta you know yeah you close do. a book on certain you relationships do. some of them you do but i still learned a lot from them right I'm not mad at them. No losses, right? None. No. You only lose when, what was it? When you die or quit? When you die or quit. It's a real thing. You, the only time you can lose is if you quit or die. Mm-hmm. And even that's a whole other thing. I mean, die. What is that? Just carbon-based body. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's, I don't know if we have time for that. But yeah, man, I do take in information. I think you got to be discerning now. There's so much information available, and it's not all good information. Ooh. Right? So I don't, I don't want to uh, pollute my sponge. So I'm quite discerning before I actually let it seep in. So there's, there's, this, there's this one that's checking out information, and then when I feel it's worthy and makes sense and isn't damaging, then I'll soak it up. But mm-hmm. not all the info. Yeah, well, I think you can attest to this, that the landscape has changed dramatically mm-hmm. with like, information, obviously in creative field and stuff as well. How much has it changed from when you first started you know, acting, yeah. creating? Oh, it's big time. I mean, also, because I'm that, I don't know what the name of the thing is. There's millennials, and there's that one little segment that was, like, digital and mono. Like, so I grew up in a non-digital age, and then, like, my later years, like, 14 non was all the digital. So I got, I was, like, uh, aware enough of both of them. Um, So the change is huge. I mean, I used to have to, like, go do an audition. Like, we'd first off, I'd have to drive to my agent's house to get the script out of her mailbox, Wow. <laughs> right, because there's I there, there was I didn't we didn't email there was no email, that that wasn't a thing. Also, no cell phones, right? So like, yeah, I mean there's a <laughs> lot, of, I, and also I have to be home for the call. Mm-hmm. My very first movie, they had to call the school to let me know I got the role. It's not like I could email me, text me, right? So they called mm-hmm. home, and I was at school. They called my school principal, called me down in the office. Ooh, and then I came, <laughs> <laughs> I came back after a phone call with David Green, who directed Children of the Dust which got nominated for an Emmy, which is pretty cool for a show. The, um, that, that's how the industry was. It was that way. But now, you know, we send in self-tapes. I used to have to fly to cities all the time. Now I just send in a self-tape that I do at home with lights like this. Um, and it makes more sense, too, especially film industry. If you, can't, if you don't look good on camera, I don't care how good your audition was in person. We're not doing theater, mm-hmm. right? So um, it's changed a lot. It's opened up doors for people. There's more opportunities and more competition. Yeah. Opens up, opens up the playing field. Yeah, yeah, it does. 
Damn. You also get drowned out, right? So you have to be better. You have to do more. You have to be more prepared than mm-hmm. you would have had to beforehand. Acting, I feel like it, it's one of those things where you do have to have a little bit of yourself in it. Would you agree or no? I mean, I think just like just on the fact that I'm in the movie, yes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's no you. I think you can't escape yourself. Um, but I do think getting out of the way of yourself is for me, there are so many different ways and different strategies uh, for actors to find a character and create what they're creating, but I can only speak on my own. I try to get out of my own way a lot, knowing, back to the Hermanum's brain dominance test. Jesse is like there all the time. I don't have to work on him being there. What I need to do is work on uh, empathizing and understanding who this character is that I'm about to become. So these neural pathways in my brain are firing automatically. I'm not thinking about the twitch that I have in my left eye and the limp and also the southern drawl and my lines and this connection. I need to have that so ingrained that these things are uh, automatically firing. Uh, and I've done my homework, so I'm not having to react. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I'm not having to act. I get to react. That's the difference too, like acting or reacting. Reacting means I have to listen and have to actually feel what you said, and then I get to react in an authentic, truthful way. All you do is try to find truth in every show. It don't matter if it's a comedy, a horror, finding truth. Uh, if you do that, you're doing well. So then who, who are your inspirations? Like, who, do you, who did you look up to and say, these are the guys I want to... Yeah, man, this question, fuck. I... Always wanted a role model. Mm. Didn't have one. So decided I'd like to be one. That's the first piece. My people I looked up to weren't in my industry initially. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather. Grandfather is Rolly Miles, CFL Hall of Fame. Scona Park named after him. Uh, five Grey Cups or whatever. Uh, my grandmother, PhD, uh, black woman. Both of these people in Edmonton in a time where they couldn't go to some hotels, so they were crushing, mm-hmm. right? And they were socialites, extroverts, partied. They were awesome. Um, so I saw their life and what they did, and I'm like that makes sense. Like I, I love that. I want that. It was, even though I was young, I'm like this is what it looks like. So for sure, looked up to them. Same thing with my parents. And then if we go like celebrities per se, uh, Amaya Angelou, um, Oprah, for sure. In more recent times, Michelle. Uh, as an actor looking up to Will Smith, what he did with his career and the choices he made and the reasons why he would and wouldn't take certain roles because he wanted to make sure his mom and grandma would be proud of everything he ever did. I love that uh, idea. Um, And then working with people, like Anthony Hopkins, he was one of the people that I worked with, and I learned so much. From him and Alec Baldwin together, it was a show together that we did, but how the subtleties and how good they are and what they do it's so cool. It's so like, also you'll get lost in his eyeballs. Like I wasn't expecting how Anthony ice, Hopkins? his icy blues. <laughs> I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Woo, it's hot here. His eyeballs. I would date one eyeball. Um, <laughs> but either way, it's, they're unbelievable. Uh, also he's six two. Like most people, he's huge. He's, he's tall. Big, he he yeah. seems like he's supposed to be like rotund circle and short, but he's not. Big guy. Um, but what they did and how they attacked their scenes was so uh, amazing for me. And I was young. I was 15 or 16 when I worked with them. But just watching them and soaking that stuff in. Um, so, yeah, role models across the board. They move. They switch all the time. Um, but early on, it was my family. And I think that's one of the big chunks. I always had that support that I was allowed to just be Jesse. Mm. Nobody was like, don't, don't. You know, maybe they did. And I forgot or whatever, but they were supportive. They believed in what I believed in as long as I didn't half-ass anything. And who wants half an ass? Yeah. Right? Nobody even makes songs about half of an ass. Like, I like big butt. <laughs> Not like, I like big half a butt. So, like, I always go full ass and everything. That's a bar right there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 Nobody makes songs about half of an Nobody ass. Nobody does, so right? People you, buy them. They, that's, you, that's what I'm saying. Go full ass every time. <laughs> Perfect, man. <laughs> Have you ever thought about doing stand up? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did it. I did it did actually. It? You know, Sterling Scott, we all know Sterling. Uh, I had him in a TV show that I was doing, and uh, I was producing the show. and I remember I was just sitting in the chair, and he kept saying, Jesse, you, you always say you want to do stand up. I was like, Yeah, I'm gonna do it one day. He's like, All right, sweet. Well, uh, how's tonight? I'm like, I, I'm the guy who says just do the stuff, mm-hmm. so it might like, sounds good. 
he's like, you're going to open for me. Um, I forget where we were. I'm like, okay. He's like, you got any material? Like, no, but I will write some right now. So I wrote, um, we'll stand up bit, uh, and did it with him and really liked it. It was, uh, I don't know. I think when you do stand up, you're not supposed to just like throw out your jokes cause they're not funny, but I'll tell you anyway what they were. Uh, cause I'm not a professional stand up comedian, but I think they were clever. I still remember a bit of it. So basically, so, hey, I, you don't want to sign an NDA or anything. Nah, I don't mind. No one's going to do it okay. better. Actually, most people will do it better than me. But I'm not scared to do. I have so much in material. I'll write another one. <laughs> um, yeah. So this one, it was about uh, uh, it was a racist thing and just how comfortable people are saying the N word, uh, and it bothered me. So I was like, you know, it's not even just the N word alone. Like they try to disguise it. You know, and the first thing that I that came to mind was. Uh, when you're trying to stop smoking and there's that gum and then you hear them on the commercial in the back like yeah just try nicorette i was like nicorette oh <laughs> Nic nicorette oh i got it i got it i'm like that's still one thing to slip them in there like that and then the terminator comes around and everyone's like oh you love arnold schwarzenegger I'm like calm the, <laughs> calm down on the cap locks on the end of his name but then the worst one was growing up winnie the pooh he had his best friend who could jump super high bounced all around you know he rhymed when he talked and they called him Tigger. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I, want, I want to switch that to Tigro. He should be called Tigro <laughs> moving forward. So my bit was on this one and it worked out okay and it was pretty fun. But stand up's fun. That's pretty good. <laughs> that, 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 that's really, that's really, that's impressive. That's like, I mean, it's a thing. It's a, it was a thing. That, I like that you just said, you know, I'm going to do it. I mean, I feel like we'll never know what we truly want to do unless we say, Fuck it, I'm just gonna just do it. Do the stuff. Do Always do the stuff. Do Always. the things. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like there's quality. There are quality. We, we go into that quality versus quantity thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The quantity, I feel like, is gathering as many experiences as you can. You know, it's like collecting dots. Yeah. You know, you, you collect dots. I was. You're a dot collector. <laughs> Polka dots. It's sweet. I like that. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> no. Tell me about your dot collection. I meant like you know the experiences. <laughs> oh yes. Are dots. Yes. Right. And you accumulate as many as you can all these different experiences and then when you one of the ex one of the dots is like oh this is what i want to i like yeah. this let me yeah. keep doing this yeah and then when you take that dot you make it bigger by connecting all the other dots sure they all contribute all those experiences contribute to that dot that you particularly liked i mean i agree with you people remind me of of, of toddlers in this way when they don't want to do things so my kid will be my four-year-old uh, Indiana George Porter Lipscomb shout out Gregory Porter one of my favorite singers ever who he was named after um, So he I will say hey Andy eat this and it's not let's say it's pepperoni pizza He wants but this has like Italian sausage on it. He won't try it. like why he's like I don't like it Like how do you know he's like I just don't like it You haven't even tried it yet, mm -hmm. right? And this happened time and time again, and then he'll try it he's like is it good? Mm-hmm like, <laughs> and how many times uh, this perfect example is when people uh, want karaoke, like, Oh, I'm not a good singer. I don't want to. As soon as they get after the years, days, months, or drinks, once they do, they won't put the microphone down. Mm, They're okay. like, Oh, it's a super fun. I love it. Right. So this idea of people are saying they don't want to do a thing. They have never tried. What they're saying is I'm scared of looking stupid in front of people. What they're saying is I'm a touch insecure and I want people to like me. What they're saying is I want to belong. And you should just say that to yourself. Uh, cause that's the real human stuff. I too don't want to look like a fool. I want to belong. I want people to like me. Uh, but I'm not going to let that want get into the way of the things I want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. That the fear of that not happening should not stop the joys that are everywhere. So just, uh, be honest with yourself. That same mirror. I'm insecure in these scenarios and my insecurities are stopping me from doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Say it out loud what they are. And then when you see it, don't let them do that anymore. Yeah. yeah. You know, what I've gotten out of this conversation is that we should all be doing karaoke. Yeah, I, I think at all times. At all times. Yeah, I have karaoke on. No, I don't. No, I do. I have never drove, driven distracted. Erase that. <laughs> I do not karaoke Go to in karaoke the car. song. What's, what's your go to karaoke song? Ooh, fun. Depends on the audience because I'm a code switcher. So if I'm in a, a white room and I see a lot of uh, baseball caps bent hard that might have like chew <laughs> dust on them, I'm going Audio Slave on the Highway, Chris Cornell song. Mm -hmm. You know, if we got more of an urban room and there's some people who have sung some R&B, it doesn't matter, they does not have to be black people, but in general, then I'm doing some Luther Vandross Ooh. Superstar. Um, you know, but then if I got like more of like a, a theatery room, then I go Miss Saigon, 
uh, and I'm singing Why God Why. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I'm having some fun, you know, and I just want to, you know, me and Mrs. Jones, because often I'll crawl across the table and like my clothes <laughs> might come off and it's a performance, <laughs> right? Um, but if I'm running out of time, then I do the Banana Boat song um, just as a send off. Mm-hmm. Uh, Day-o, day-o. You got a good a good list of go tos. Yeah, those are the go tos. You yeah. gotta know for the room. Gotta gotta be ready for the room. Yeah. Sounds like you're prepared. I mean, listen, I just a record. Uh, first place, uh, Alberta Karaoke Provincials, uh, Nationals. I got third. It was Wait, unfortunate. Hold on a second. Yeah, then they have Worlds. I didn't make it to Worlds. There's karaoke competition every year. Yeah, yeah, and you win money. There's money involved. There is. Yeah. I have some shitty friends. Nobody has ever told me about this ever. Yeah, that's that's one. There's one in Edmonton. Uh, shout out to Blackout. That'd be uh, uh, Abby A, uh, Timothy Noel, myself. We call ourselves Blackout. It's our karaoke group name. Uh. We all ended up at a karaoke bar together, and rarely are there three over six foot two black men karaoke. <laughs> so we decided we must do a song together mm. and we did and the host is like it's a full blackout in here white guy fully inappropriate but hilarious so we, st- <laughs> we, we kept it and that was our karaoke name and we won a couple karaoke competitions it was fun karaoke's great damn i'm very disappointed in my friend group i mean you can switch it up that's the beauty of it what do you mean T- tell your friends they're fired you're getting new ones oh yeah oh yeah you can always switch it up you yeah can switch always it up. Control it. do you know you're down for some karaoke oh, yeah. my man good he's you're still in the group <laughs> So what's what's next for Jesse? Um, like t- today, next week, because you know this is the thing. Uh, a lot of things mm-hmm. uh, are next. Um, a few things are written in stone. Um, a lot of them are things I'm working on with full intention of having them come to fruition. But they all live within the entertainment world, the speaking world, the family world, uh, writing, music. Yeah, I, continued creation and uh, leveling up uh, the the quality of the production when it's done. So constantly collabing and learning, growing, reading, and then making things that I didn't think were possible maybe a year ago. Pushing the limits, I think. That's and not just to push them, like to, I'm not like a no fear t-shirt. It's not what's happening. Like, do you know no fear? Probably not, hey? Some people here do know no fear, no fear. Do you remember Varney at least? Oh, no. Jeez, you missing some good clothes. What's the one with the little dog on it? This is the room is the wrong room. <laughs> <laughs> either way, either way, I'm not making bumper stickers. I just mean like that type of life feeds me. Mm-hmm. The type of life of trying to find what I can do and surprising myself. The goal for me every day, and by the way, I don't do this most days. I'm getting better at it, but being able to look in the mirror at the end of the day and say, I'm proud of you, which means there's no room because you can remember everything. You can't hide from yourself. But to say I'm proud of you in the mirror every day, I can't see how you couldn't just crush at life. Like mm-hmm. that's simply being it. Because everything you said you were going to do or could have worked harder on or cut someone off and flipped them off or didn't call that person back, it shows up right when you're about to say I'm proud. You're like, ah, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be better. But like it's a good litmus test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Proud of you. Mm-hmm. It's really simple. Mm-hmm. To look in the mirror every day and if you're happy with what you did today. Yeah. Simple. If you're not, do better tomorrow. You know what? I've added a new sentence. I'm proud of you. And if you're not, it's okay. I still love you. But in the mirror, that's key. You have to love yourself, like fully mm-hmm. love yourself. Be okay with yourself wherever you're at, even though you're maybe moving somewhere else and going in a different direction. It's hard to get there if you haven't accepted where you're at. I think loving where you're at. You can never get there unless you love where you are. You have to be here to get there. Mm-hmm. So this idea of like, all I want to do is be here. How, you, you, can't, you have to love this. Th- this got you there. Mm-hmm. Whatever you are, whatever you've done, whatever you didn't do, if you're going somewhere, you got to be thankful for all of that and where you are right now. Yeah, you got to live in the moment, right? Mm-hmm. I think sometimes we're too caught up in, oh, where, like, where did I got to do to be over here? And sometimes we get caught up with, oh, you know, I messed up over here. If I didn't do this this way, I would have been here. You mm-hmm. know, we get caught up with everything outside of yeah. what can I do right now that was another pandemic gift right we didn't have a lot of other things to be distracted on so we were able to look at some of the beautiful wonderful things that we could just do in the now right Mm -hmm. like there was sometimes like i'm so restless but then once you get over that piece and whether it's like learning to meditate or cleaning the new thing or building this thing like these are joys you would never have even been able to do and all you can do is be here right now um and whatever you do with that time's up to you but i think it's kind of cool the world slowed down got a little bit more sensitive you got a lot more sensitive. yeah I, I agree what would you say to the person that is right now in a place they don't want to be 
but see themselves so much, you know, further along than where they're at right now. Yeah. So that person, it'd be, I feel like there's two different people that are, you know, there's, there's the person who is in a place they don't want to be and they don't see the light. Right. And for that person, I would tell them that there are people there that are rooting for you, need you. They need you. Uh, they are relying on you. They love you. They want to be there for you because this feeling of, of loneliness is such a dangerous thing. So that's that one version that it may feel like there isn't, but there are people who are watching you and are going to learn from you and actually they need you. They need you. For the person who is just feeling they're in a rut and they know they want to do this thing, I'd say stop being so selfish. You're selfish right now because you know what you want to do and your gifts and talents aren't just for you. You have them so that you could inspire other people, so they can see themselves in you and know that they could do it. You see the light, you're not walking to it. You're lazy and you're selfish, and I'm not going to coddle you. You already know. Just go do the thing and don't do it just for yourself. Don't do it for yourself. It's actually not for yourself. If you can sing and all you do is sing in the basement and you have a beautiful voice, that's not your voice alone. Why do you think you got this gift? Why would you get an audible gift that's loud that no one else is supposed to hear? Selfish, <laughs> selfish person. Yeah. Get up, walk to the light, and go shine bright so everyone can see you. And so someone else who finds uh, some similarities in you, like super shy person who was really worried and insecure that still did it, that means I can do it too. Oh, and they look like you and they act like, wow, be that representative so that other people, same people you say you care about and you want to help and you wish they would do it, be the example, take the risk, you see the light, you already have the directions, just, I'm looking at it, walk over there, crawl, move, just do. Something. Yes. Damn. Powerful shit. I don't know about you guys, I got... <laughs> I'm feeling I'm like go after it today. <laughs> you might you already you're already doing it. Look, I'm at your podcast. What are you talking about? Gift no. to Gab. You already started. You're doing a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And it is inspiring. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. I mean, let us know where we can find you, where we can see your work. Yeah, I mean, you know, Google. Uh <laughs> <laughs> but also at the Lipscomb on all the socials. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Awesome, brother. My man, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. The gifted gab, baby. We're here, at Jesse Lipscomb. And, you know, just like that, we're gone. I'm starting a dot collection. A dot collection? Yeah, remember you said I collect dots? Oh, the dots. <laughs> 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 <laughs>